I, uh, I, I never would have imagined at, at any point in my life that I'd be, I'd be standing here today. In fact, everybody has been like, have, are you ready? Are you ready? And I kind of feel like I was born ready. I just wasn't well yet, you know? So I was born with OCD. I, I had it my whole life, um, but I'm not my OCD. My OCD is a disease. And, uh, and being born with it and having it, you know, some, some of us were born with it and some of us got it later down the road, but being born with it, I had nothing to compare myself to. I just knew myself with OCD the whole time. So I really didn't know the difference between Ethan and OCD. I thought that was me. So finding out that difference really played a huge part in me getting better. Today, I live in Los Angeles. My parents live in South Florida, so I live 3,000 miles away from my family. I see them um, twice a year. Um, I do, I, uh, I write, direct, I produce. Um, it's a tough industry out here, but um, people are like, you moved out here all by yourself? I'm like, I'm doing better from OCD. That's like not a big deal, you know? So, um, but obviously there was a middle. There's a middle between me here now today and, and birth, and that's what I want to share with you. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about my childhood in my early 20s, and then I want to talk about when things really got bad to today, if that's okay with you. So I'm going to be showing some video. God bless my therapist in Florida at the Neural Behavioral Institute. Um, they took, that was just phase one. <laughs> but they took video of me when I was sick. And they took video of my ERPs. And I have some of those videos today. And I've never shown them to anybody. I've, I've seen them, my parents won't watch them, and my therapists have seen them. So I'm kind of going from no one to a thousand people, but like go big or go home, you know? So, um, so I just want to preface, I'm going to be showing a few of these throughout the speech, and, and they may be a little triggering, a little jarring, um, but I just want to, so this first video was probably within the first week. Now, I, I, I was six when I was diagnosed, and I never got, I never heard ERP until I was 32 years old. And I went to therapists my whole life. So um, this was about, this is a week after I got out of a psychiatric locked unit facility. Um, my OCD was so bad that they thought I was psychotic. I didn't have OCD. And, and my parents refused to believe that, found the foundation on the website and discovered NBI that was 20 minutes away from my house. So the first piece I want to show you is within that first week. Put your hands up. No, oh, because I'm going to hurt myself. <laughs> Come on, Ethan, hurt yourself. Come on, let me see you do it. Like this. You're gonna cut off my legs? Just cut off my arm. I have no legs. He's like, I need more feet. Here, <laughs> Come on, Ethan, go. Hurt yourself. Oh, you're here, I'm okay with your ear. Close our eyes, go. No! Ethan, you need to help us. If you so that was a week after I got out of a psychiatric institute. And really, it's important to show that because that's what OCD looks like. You know, and not a lot of people get to see it. And, and watching it now, I don't even recognize that person. It's very, very weird to watch it and to know that I was that far. So I'll show you a little bit more, but that was, that's who I was and this is who I am today. So it's... So, now the exciting part. So how did I get from there? I was born with OCD. According to my mom, my first words were bug or fly. And we didn't get that for the first three or four years till I could elaborate on that. And apparently I had a fear of swallowing a fly or a bug in my head exploding. So, you have to laugh at it. You can laugh. You, la you know, in retrospect, you have to laugh at OCD, like Jeff said. I mean, there's a humor to it. It's funny, you know? Um, so. Apparently, I just, I don't know where I got it in my head, somewhere in the womb, um, I don't know, but uh, I was afraid that I was gonna swallow a fly and die, so my first words. So now when my parents call, I'm like, mama? Just to give them that moment that they didn't have when I was a baby. Um, <laughs> in, <laughs> when I was in kindergarten, uh, I remember the teacher telling us that we were going to have an eclipse that day, and but don't stare at the sun, you're gonna go blind. Well, forget it. I was like, my mom, it was all about my mom. I was like, my mom's gonna look at the sun, she's gonna go blind. So I went home, like, I can't leave tomorrow. I'm staying with you and I have to make sure that you don't look at the sun. And she's like, I'm not gonna look at the sun. We had a whole conversation. She's like, look, I'll make a sign. I'll put it around my neck. She, I, I stayed with her and, I, and she did not look at the sun. 
I made sure she didn't, she didn't look at the sun. Fortunately, later on, my OCD got really selfish and I didn't care about anybody else but me. So, <laughs> but I wouldn't leave my mom's side. Um, and, and, and as a child, I had very classic OCD, very, very classic. Choking, afraid I was gonna choke. Um, I was ritualizing, I was tapping, I was counting. I had a six hour ritual at bedtime. I had a fear of throwing up. So I would blink at the clock and I had to blink with the blinking colon. And I had to make it like every time the colon was on the clock, my eyes had to be closed and when it was away, open. So it looked like it was never there. And I would do that and I would, if I, if I got it wrong, I'd have to start over. So I'd inevitably do it like six to seven hours a night just to make sure that I didn't throw up. Um, I went to my first therapist at six. Um, now this was the early 80s, so you know, OCD wasn't really in the consciousness. That wasn't really something people talked about. Kids were weird, we had our own shtick. So like my doctor, we played Clue and he gave me Doritos, um, <laughs> which was awesome. And I wish that like eating had been the fix. Well, obviously <laughs> I've been trying, but um, that there, you're not supposed to laugh at that part. <laughs> but I would have developed like all-you-can-eat sushi buffet therapy. That would be amazing. Um, but he'd be like, so how's your childhood? What's going on? You know, so I didn't, I didn't get anything. As I got older, when I was 14 and a freshman in high school, and this has been going on a while, um, I went to a therapist who finally said, your son has OCD. And we were like, what's that? And he started to explain what OCD was, and things started to make sense. So I had what was wrong with me very early on. But keep in mind, I also had a separation issue. I'd still never left my mom's side. I never went through a separation period. So during that eight years old to 12 years old where everybody's going to friend's house, spending the night, sleepaway camp, and all that, no, 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 no. I, would, I, was, I was with my parents 24 seven. And I had friends, they would come over, they could spend the night, no problem, but anything other than that. Um, but it was very evident that something was wrong. Um, I was always wanting to go to the doctor to get checked out. Now, I wasn't afraid of germs, but I was afraid of getting sick. So if I, had a, if I had a headache, it was a brain tumor. If I had a fever, it was meningitis. And I was scared of school, and I was scared of getting sick. And I remember I would pull stunts to try to get out of school. So at first, they were pretty benign stunts. Like, I remember going to my mom's makeup and putting rouge on my cheeks and be like, I have a fever. You know, um, but then things got started to get more serious. In sixth grade, I would not go to school. My mom would take my dad to the train. This is when we lived in Jersey. So I remember when they left, I would scratch my stomach up till it was bleeding. And then when she came home, I told her that I fell down the stairs. And so she took me to the doctor and I got out of school. And I didn't think twice about it. I'm like, cool, you know, I'm all about the theater. Um, whatever. Um, by the time I was in high school, it, the, the hypochondriasis was like at full swing. I carried a thermometer. I carried three thermometers around me and they, I named them Larry, Moe, and Curly. Um, and I had my main thermometer and then a backup thermometer and then a backup thermometer to the backup thermometer. And I had certain numbers that it had to be, otherwise I was sick and I needed to go to a doctor. And I took my temperature probably upwards of 60 times a day. And nobody knew. You know, I would go to the bathroom and hide in the stall. One time I got caught, and I'm like, I'm checking my blood sugar. And they're like, with that? And I'm like, it's, it's new. <laughs> During my 20s, but this whole time I was functional. Now, I was miserable, but I was functional. And if you'd asked me then, and when I went to NBI for the first time, and they said, you know, Ethan, you're really, really sick, I would argue. I would be like, nah. -uh. I've done this and I've done that and I've, I work and I've been on TV and I have, I have entire months where I'm perfectly fine and they would say, no, Ethan, you're sick. I didn't get it. I didn't get that I wasn't being present-minded, that I wasn't living in the moment, that I was still, and to me, functioning was living, functioning miserably or functioning happy. So throughout my 20s, I, I started working. I did drop out of college because of OCD. I lasted three months. My mom came to live with me in Dallas um, at a hotel nearby the last month just so I'd finished the semester because I couldn't be away from her. Um, so I was in South Florida, and I was doing um, acting. And, and so obviously, the title of my, my keynote is um, I played OCD on TV, but in real life, I'm a serial killer. No, that's not right. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Some doctor sociopath. Um, so let me show you. Let me show, I'm going to show you the clip from, from you guys want to see the clip from Dexter? Okay, now let me preface by saying it's a little graphic, so if it triggers you or that kind of thing, blood triggers you, I'd close your eyes, but it is a good exposure. It was a really good exposure to me. I'm gonna tell you what was going through my mind as this was happening, so let's go ahead and take a look. So I just killed this girl. 
Dexter comes up behind me and puts me to sleep. And now, you'll like this exposure. I didn't know it was an exposure at the time, but that's me duct taped down to the table. So now what's funny here is you're watching and I'm acting, but really what was going through my mind was I had these ribs at lunch and I was afraid that they, were, they weren't cooked and that I was gonna have a stomach bug and throw up and have diarrhea and ruin the shoot. So like this whole time, like you look like, oh, he's acting in the moment, but I was going, oh my God, I'm gonna poop, I'm taped down, I'm gonna ruin everything, this is not good. I almost didn't come out of my trailer, right here is about to chop me up and we cut, okay. <laughs> so, so that was my death scene, but Thanks. I'd like to thank my agent. Um, and I'll never get to. Maybe I will. But that was, that was living for me, and that's what I thought it was. I never enjoyed any time I was shooting anything. I was always terrified, and then when I got home, in the safety of my home, then I felt proud. And I thought that's the way life was. I'm supposed to be miserable during this time. And so in 2009, I had just finished a movie I'll say the name, it's called Wild Things Foursome. But it's on Cinemax a lot, but it's not, it's not what you think it was. Um, anyway, I just, finished, I just finished shooting it, and um, I had gotten off my medications with a new psychiatrist. I've been on meds since I was 14, and I wanted to know what I was like off medication. So uh, with the help of my doctor, we got off all my meds, and I was doing really well for about a month and I had a beautiful girlfriend, and all of a sudden, in one fell swoop, um, my girlfriend dumped me, um, my grandfather died, and, uh, and uh, I was off my medication, and I just spiraled. And um, my symptoms became so severe that I went from functioning with OCD to not functioning. And so my symptoms, a doctor said to me when he was seeing if I was suicidal, he asked, are you, are you a danger to yourself? Will you impulsively hurt yourself? And I said, no, I've never thought about suicide. And then I got in the car and went, oh my God, what if I'm a danger to myself? <laughs> and literally, I'd taken my temperature for 16 years. I stopped that day and never took my temperature again. It switched to fear of harming myself. And then I thought, and then so I, I couldn't walk by Lysol or Clorox. I was afraid I was going to drink it. I couldn't make my food because I was afraid I was going to poison it. I would sit at the table and be like, did I poison it? Did I not poison it? Okay, I can't eat it. I lost 100 pounds. Um, I hit my head accidentally and thought, oh my God, what if I hit my head and get a bleed and die? And then I thought, wait a minute, what if I make fists and just start banging my head and start? And then I became scared of my own hands. So I... Um, at my lowest point, I was living in my parents' house in their bedroom, guest bedroom, and I would tie my hands up in the elastic of my underwear, and I would then put them under my body and lay on it 24-7. And, um, and my parents would feed me, and my parents would give me water. Um, I never left because I was just so afraid I was going to hurt myself, and I didn't want to die. Um, the week before I got put in a psychiatric facility, um, you know, I was compulsing. Now here was my compulsion. I would go get CAT scans. So it's, it was expensive. I glow in the dark now, which the ladies like, but <laughs> you know. Um, so my parents caught on that I was doing this and how severe my OCD had gotten. And, um, and so they forbade me to go to the, you know, go to the ER and I was so dysregulated that day, crying, screaming all night. I knew I was gonna die, that they finally had to take me and do the hardest thing, they, one of the hardest things they ever had to do, which is put me in a psychiatric unit. In there, the doctor said I did not have OCD, I was psychotic, and I needed to be put in a home the rest of my life. Now, as we know, OCD is such an awful battle because they're healthy parts of our brain, and they're working, and we're going, why are we doing this? This is illogical, but we're doing it anyway. So here I am in a psych ward around legitimately psychotic people with schizophrenia and stuff like that. I'm around them going, holy crap, I'm not, I'm not that. But the doctors are saying I'm that, so maybe I am that. You know, and they're treating me like that. They, they, they would strap me up, they would lock me, you know. Um, and it was absolutely terrifying. In retrospect, there's some funny moments. <laughs> I just want to share one with you. I was, in, I was in them three times. Now, 
The last two times I went because I wanted to go. It was a choice. And I wanted to go because they were connected to a hospital. And I thought to myself, awesome, if I hit my head, I'm totally safe there because th there's a hospital right there. So the second two times I would push my doctors just by acting nuts and, and threatening then they'd be like, we're just going to send you. So this one time, so I'd stop doing it, they sent me to the county psych ward. I got there, I was like, I don't have OCD, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> so I'm standing in the hallway, and this guy wheels up, and he goes, get out of my way! And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, and I moved, and he still thought I was in his way, and he, now, not knowing this, it's freaky. He took off his leg and threw it at me. He was an amputee, but when you don't know that and you just see. <laughs> and then you hear the nurse go, Charlie, don't throw the leg again, man. <laughs> so they took his leg away. It was like the teacher putting it in the drawer. You can have it tomorrow. <laughs> That's when I was like, I'm fine. I'm good. What? OCD? No. Uh, it was hell, though. I got, out of the, I got out of the psych ward, and um, I was in a honeymoon period because there were no triggers there, but within days, I was back to, in my bed. My parents were desperate. They refused to believe um, that I was psychotic. I'd OCD my whole life, and they found the Foundation website. And on the Foundation website, they found NBI, which was 20 minutes away from my house, and they called, and my dad said, you have to help my child. And they saw me the next day, and, um, and that's when I started treatment for the first time. I was 32 years old. There, and it's amazing because I, half my treatment team is here from all over the country, and it's so surreal to sit here and look at them and kind of flash back to when I was on their couch listening to them talk. You know, um, it's, it's really amazing. Um, so I was introduced to ERP. It was completely foreign to me. Um, OCD treatment in general was completely foreign to me, and these folks were hardcore. The first day I was there, I don't know if you've known, some of you know Katia Moritz. She took me, and she's like, I want you to talk to somebody. First day out of a cycle. Okay, so she sits me down, and there's a whole family, and like a six and seven year old, and she literally goes, this is what happens if you don't get therapy. I was like, oh man, this, this sucks. Anyway, I'll speed this up. So, um, so I started doing ERP. And for those of you that have done ERP, it's miserable, right? It's so painful. And, and you're facing your biggest fear. And I was so resistant to it. My brain's telling me one thing. How could my brain be wrong? My brain's not wrong. Our brain tells us when something dangerous is happening. I know I'm right. People die. People die from head injuries. So we have our initial resistance, and they were talking about, you have to be willing to get well. I knew I wanted to get well, I just didn't know how. And they were telling me that doing these things and hitting my head and pretending to drink Clorox would help me. And I was like, you're out of your minds. Like, I'm the one here? <laughs> so this clip is, I had developed, in the middle of all this, I had developed a fear of taking my medication. Um, and so uh, I was afraid that I was going to overdose accidentally and take all my pills. So I got to a point where I wouldn't go near them and I was counting them and recounting them and putting them in plastic bags to make sure I could see them and I would hold them above my head to go to sleep. So this is an ERP. And it's important that you see this because this is, this is the struggle. This is those initial moments. It doesn't scare me. All right, put it in your mouth. Oh, you only left one down. Do you get the feeling? Do you have the feeling that you took them? Ethan, do you have the feeling? I'm talking to you. Stop crying. No crying. Do you have a feeling, Ethan? Stop the drama, Ethan. I have to Stop. leave here, though, and I, I can't. I can't go back home. Okay. Now take this all, all this fun. I can't go back And I'll let it play a second. What was amazing about this is I'd always been to a therapist, and they always made me feel better. I was crying. I was in the worst pain of my life, and this lady wasn't acknowledging it. 
She didn't care that I was crying or upset. I wanted a hug. I wanted somebody to tell me that it was going to be okay. I wanted a pill to say, this is going to make you better. And this lady's just throwing stuff in my face and not acknowledging. And that was every day for eight months. Oh, and I went, it was five, day, five sessions a day, five days a week for eight months. It was like that. Um, unfortunately, um, it only got me so far. And they realized that I needed to be away from my family. So with that, I went to the OCD Institute at Harvard, phase two. Except I'd never been away from my parents before. So it was really hard to go. So I went to the OCD Institute, and there I was for two and a half months. And Jason Elias, who's here, was my, was my BT. And, and I, I drove him and Diane Davey insane. Like they wanted to check in to themselves. <laughs> I was screaming, crying. I, call, I would call my mom 350 times a day. They took away my phone. I would borrow other people's phones. I got kicked out of the OCDI. Now what's amazing before I got kicked out is my therapist in Florida did not stop treating me. They were on the phone with Dr. Elias and Diane and my therapist, and they were constantly collaborating. And that, these are strangers. I didn't meet these people. They didn't owe me anything. I, 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 it's beyond, I would have given up on me because I kept, I kept messing up over and over again. I don't like to use the word mess up, but I can't think of it right now. Um, disappointing with my OCD. And, and, and they were collaborating, and they'd be like, what do we do with him now? And so there was this collaboration going on cross-country, cross-facility. This is why I got kicked out. Uh, as you guys know by now, I'm, I'm, I fake things. <laughs> so Jason says to me, we're going to do an ERP, and I'll make this quick. What do I have till 9.30? OK, perfect. So we'll be three hours good, guys. Um, <laughs> I had to pee before I got up here, so I'm kind of whatever. Oh, there's a glass. No, I'm kidding. Um, so it, I literally, it was January 2nd, 2011. And is, is my lavalier on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So it was 2011, and, um, and Jason says, we're going to do the biggest ERP we've ever done. And I said, OK, what are we going to do? We're going to hit our heads as hard as we can. I'm like, dude, OK, I know I'm a little crazy, but that, that's dangerous. He's like, no, it's not. Look. And he slams his head as hard as he can. <laughs> and again, I'm like, what the, where am I? What's going on? So I refused to do it. And I, again, was what you saw in the videos, crying, crying, crying. He said, Ethan, if you do not do it, I'm calling security. You just don't want to get well. I don't think they have security, but. <laughs> but apparently, they had like rifles and, you know. So anyway, at the last moment, I was like, fine, fine, I'll do it, I'll do it. And I slammed my head. He's like, awesome, go get a haircut. Go do what? Go get a haircut. Go to the grocery store. I'm like, OK, uh, huh? I didn't get it. I didn't get the therapy yet. I, after all this time, I could explain it to people. I could, I could write out treatment plans for people with OCD. But I couldn't flip the switch myself. I couldn't shift. I'd had it for so long, it was so embedded in my head, I couldn't make the shift. And it was so frustrating, because I knew what I had, and I knew what I had to do, but I just didn't understand. I didn't understand. I just didn't understand how to switch it. So I go down to the barber shop, and I'm getting my hair cut, and I become as dysregulated as the night before I went into the psychiatric ward. I'm convinced I'm going to die. And I'd filed, I filled out a contract with my family that stated, if I went to the hospital to get checked out, I would be cut off. I would be dead to them, no more help, no more anything. So I realized I couldn't go to the hospital, but then I thought, wait a minute, the hospital could come to me. So I left the barbershop mid-haircut, I walked three blocks away, I found a sharp rock, and I cut my head open. Now I didn't do it to hurt myself, even though I was hurting myself. I did it to sell the fact that I'd slipped on the ice and hit my head, because there were six feet of snow on the ground. Then I walked around the corner, and I found a snowbank, and I jumped face first into it and laid there for 25 minutes till somebody found me and called 911. Paramedics come. Now, of course, I know everything about bleeds. So they're rolling me over. I'm shaking my eyes. They're asking me questions. I'm like, yes, I see a square in my pupil on the right side that's three centimeters wide. You know, 
Now, the thing that I didn't consider was I gave myself hypothermia <laughs> laying in a snowbank. And what, what do they do? They cut you open and warm you up. Well, I'd lost 100 pounds, and my parents had sent me designer jeans, which I never had in my whole life. And I loved these jeans. I wore them every day at the OCDI. So they're literally, I pretend to be unconscious, and they're cutting open my jeans. And I'm laying there going, oh, man, I didn't think this through. <laughs> mm. Go to the hospital, get a CAT scan. You're fine. I go back to the OCDI. Like, nothing happened. Just like I washed my hands one time. And I was going to take it to the grave with me. Next day, I, go to J I get called in at 9 a.m. to Jason's office, and, and my therapists are there. The phone's there with all my therapists in Florida, Dr. Moritz, my parents. They're like, we know you faked this. And I, and I stuck to it. And they're like, this is your chance to own it for the first time in your life. And I was like, I didn't do it. I, I really, this really happened. And Dr. Moritz says, fine, but if we find out, you're done. And you know, they have cameras on the lights, so we're going to contact the police and get footage and see what really happened. Now, I thought of that. I was walking and looking for cameras, but then I was like, crap, what if I missed one? <laughs> so I told the truth. I let it out. And this was the beginning of my journey. This is really where my therapy started. I was so far gone. You don't have to get there. I'm 32 years old and I missed half my life. And I've met people that are 60 and just got well. So I am so blessed to be where I am today. And I would not trade my experiences for anything because I get to do this. But if you're in therapy and you're just like, well, I can hide it or I'm, just, I'm coping, I can get by, that's what happens. This is where you end up if you don't just surrender to it all. And you don't have to go through this. And I'm going to tell you what happened next, what I went through. Everybody knows here now that, that being near my family was the most important thing in my life. I had to be near my parents. It was the most safest place I'd ever known. At this point, they didn't know what to do with me. I get called into the office about a week later. They said, we're kicking you out. I get it. I pulled some stuff a little bit. To this day, Jenny Key calls me Snowbank, by the way. Glad he's in that bed. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> They'd come up with a plan. Again, again, they did not give up on me. After I disappointed and disappointed, and I didn't disappoint my OCD, it was just too much. And they're still trying. I mean, I'd had eight months of NBI therapy, five days a week, two and a half months of treatment at the OCDI, and I pull the snowbank thing? What? And they're still trying to help me. I mean, these are the people in this room. So I sit down, and I'm like, so when do I come back to Florida? And they say, no, you're not allowed to come back to Florida. You're banned from the state of Florida. <laughs> you can ban me from the state of Florida? Yeah, you're banned from the state of Florida. If you come back, we're going to arrest you for trespassing. <laughs> I was freaking out. What do I have to do? Well, we've, we're, uh, I've talked to your parents, and this is Katya. We've talked to your parents, and we've sold your condo, and we've sold uh, your car, and we've sold all your furniture. You need to stay in Boston and have a new life, and we may talk to you. We may not. We don't know. In exchange for that, we'll continue to pay for outpatient therapy three days a week. And that's it. Go, go live a life, and we may see you. We may not. And they hung up the phone. And that was the first time I was backed into a corner I couldn't get out of. I was always able to manipulate myself out of a corner, and I couldn't do it. There was no choice. Three days later, I moved out. I had $300, and I found a crack house in the south part of Boston <laughs> off Craigslist. <laughs> They're really good business people. I mean, like, <laughs> if you're looking right now, you meant no. I laid in bed for six days. I didn't get up. I didn't eat. I didn't drink. I, I, I was going to the bathroom in the bed. And on the sixth day, I realized that I was going to die. And I didn't want to die. So I said to myself, what do I have to do to not die? Oh, I should eat something. Okay, wait, how do I do that? 
Oh, there's a market down the street. I can go and get food. Oh, but wait, no, I can't because I'm having these thoughts and I can't get out of bed. Oh, but wait, if I don't and I listen to my thoughts, I'm going to die. So I got up and I went. Because my doctors realized that everything had to be stripped away from me in order for me to not indulge my OCD. And there was a 50% chance that I was going to die anyway. But you know what they said to my parents? You don't have a son right now. He's gone. For my parents, I'll talk about my parents in a minute. So I did. I went to the store and I got some food and that was the beginning of my real, my, my change. But that was my bottom. It doesn't have to be your bottom at all. And for the next six months, it was the hardest thing I ever did, but I did move out of the crack house two weeks later. I called Jason, I'm like, I gotta move, I'm gonna get killed here, and the idea isn't to kill me, right? <laughs> but I got a job, but, oh, but I'm from the south, it was the middle of winter, six feet on the snow, I've never, like, I've been in snow three times, so I took the bus, I walked everywhere, I walked four miles in the snow uphill to go to, to, go to work, I can say that to my grandparents, and my grandkids, and it's true, I'm so psyched about that. <laughs> so anyway, that's the house that I moved into, and that was, the, that was the snow. And then, go, uh, wait, wait on the next slide. <laughs> so, so as I'm getting better, I, I meet a girl on J-Date. I'm like, I need to meet people. And I get a girlfriend. So I, I go to her, take the subway everywhere, and I go to her stop. And this is, it's at night, and this is the first thing I see when I get off the subway. It's a CVS and the P was out. I'm like, no, I'm gonna get him. So like every time I went to her house, I was kind of like. <laughs> I got better. I got a job at Guitar Center. My parents called me in June. They said, we wanna come visit you. I said, no, I'm busy. Can you come in July? They were like, huh? What, who is this? In August of, 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 in August of 2011, I went to Jason's office and said, okay, I'm ready to go to LA. Something I wanted to do my whole life. He goes, great, let's do it. I went home for two weeks, saw my family and friends. My cat had passed away while I was gone. And on September 14th, 2011, I moved to Los Angeles. And, and a, two or three weeks later, I booked a movie and went to Mississippi for two and a half months. And I haven't looked back. But here's, here's, good, we have 10 minutes. Here's what I want to talk about, because really that's only half the story, right? So I have LA to today, and I still live with OCD. I still live with emotional dysregulation. So how does that work, you know? And that's the thing that I don't hear a lot, and I, I'm so excited to talk about. So the shift for me was forced. When people ask me, how did I make the shift? I said, I don't know. But I watched everybody else in my class at OCDI and NBI get well on their own. And I couldn't, but you can. Mine was just so bad. At that point, I couldn't do it on my own. But I wanted to show you that footage because you do not have to be there or get there or do that. So the amount of pain that you invest today is worth the pleasure for the rest of your life. My family saved my life. My parents saved my life. I'm an only child. They love me to the ends of the earth. And, and therapy for parents is so counterintuitive, as you, some of you know. It is the hardest thing. Had my parents not said yes when they said, you need to let him die. I probably would have died or I'd be in a home right now. But what was explained to them was, your son's already dead, but let's pretend he's not. Let's pretend he has a rare disease and he's gonna die. And there's a surgery and there's a 50% chance that he's gonna die from this surgery, but there's a 50% chance that he's gonna live. Would you give him the surgery? And of course the answer is yes. And so this was the exact same thing. Well, this is that surgery. And so whatever pain I went through, 
my parents went through pain equal, if not worse, because they had to say goodbye to me. They had to let me die and make, and, and not even say, I love you. It was like, we hate you. Hang up the phone. And that was the last time I heard from them until months, months later. It is so important for the family to be involved in therapy because without it, family, friends, whoever is the person involved, because they just don't have OCD, the whole, the whole group has OCD because we're all impacted by it. And my therapist from, from South Florida to Massachusetts and Massachusetts to my therapist here in Los Angeles, Michelle, they all knew that family was important and they evolved them for the very beginning and I am so blessed for that because if that weren't the case, I would not be well, nor would I maintain my mental health. Because I go home and home is not a fun place. I go back to the house where all that happened and it's not okay. I, and you know, and my parents know what to look for. They know what to say. You know, get involved. And if you're not involved, talk to your therapists and be like, we want to be involved in our kids' treatment. We want to learn as much as we can how to talk to them, how to act around them, what to say. Realize that you're not yelling at your kid, you're yelling at their OCD. I said earlier, I'm not my OCD. I was born with it. What was the difference? And I finally realized, wait a minute. The difference is the person I always wanted to be while I was sick, that was Ethan. The way I acted, that was OCD. So when I got better, and I wanted to be the rock in everybody's life, and I wanted to be the support system, and I wanted to be the friend that was always there, I could do it. That was Ethan. That conversation in my brain, no, 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 don't do that. Oh, wait, 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 you're afraid of that. That was OCD. It took radical faith to do what I did. And it's an important topic, radical faith. Because when you don't have anything else, it's the only thing else to hold on to. And as described to me early on, radical faith is simply jump. We're not going to tell you where you're going to land, but jump anyway. We promise you on the other side is this glorious place. I was told that from the very beginning, and I didn't believe it, and I wouldn't do it because my brain, I'm a smart guy. What are you talking about? I know what's right for me. But at the end of the day, therapy is so easy. It's two things you have to do, you guys. If you're in therapy, two things you have to do. Listen and say yes. That's it. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to quite. Now, P.S., I sucked at that. I was like, I'm not listening and F all of you. I also went through like every box of Kleenex in their office for months. But anyway, so seriously, just listen and say yes. And leave the rest to them. Hand over the keys to the car. Let somebody else drive for a little while. My transition to normal life was really hard. I was told I couldn't go to a doctor. The first time I got sick in Los Angeles, I was really sick. And I called my therapist. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I can't go to a doctor. She's like, what do you mean you can't go to a doctor? It's like, well, I'm really sick, but I'm not allowed to go to a doctor. She's like, you go to a doctor. I'm like, no, uh Dr. Moritz says I can't go to a doctor. <laughs> I'm not going to a doctor. The bullet wound will heal itself. <laughs> so I had to ask myself, well, wait, when is it legit and when is it OCD, right? Do we ask ourselves that? When is it legit and when is OCD? The answer is, you don't know. You don't know. You'll find out as you go along. I went to the doctor. I happened to be sick. It triggered me. Whatever. I went back. I've been to the doctor a few times when I didn't need to go. I don't know. But at this point, what happened in Boston is living became more important than my OCD. Survival became more important than my OCD. So. You know, when you're doing anything and you question, is this OCD, is it not OCD? And you, become, you can become obsessive about OCD. Oh, great, is this OCD, is this not OCD? I don't know. The question is, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Go live your life. Life, I'll, I'll end on two points. Do I have time for two points? Okay. The way I look at life. And these are all things that I discovered along the way. I am not an authority. I am not a teacher. I am you. And I, I mean, I swear to God, I would sit there and listen to speakers like me and be like, oh, if I could just be in his shoes, if I could just somehow transport and be in his shoes and never have to worry about this again, I would pray so hard to just wake up as somebody else. 
And I wouldn't. I'd wake up as me. And I was like, damn. I do not have abs. No, that is not what I thought. <laughs> when I was involved in life now, being involved in life, life is compromised of what? Life is compromised of good and bad. I realize that the bad is just as good as the good. Because where I had come from, I wasn't even playing the game of life. I was, I was handcuffed to a bleacher somewhere. So whether I'm sick, whether I just got a part in a movie, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying I don't get sad. I don't, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I'm just saying that all of it is part of life, and I get to live life, so that's okay by me. Does that make sense? I'm going to tell you guys something. My grandmother is my best friend in the world. She refused to do anything Dr. Marit said. She's like, you cannot call him baby. I'll call him baby when I want to call him baby. <laughs> my grandma died unexpectedly 16 days ago. And when it happened, I thought, oh my God, I got I to do this OCD thing. And then I realized, wait a minute, there is no better place for me to be than right here. Now, we haven't had the funeral yet. The first available time to have the funeral was this weekend. So it'll be next weekend to say goodbye. But there's no better place I'd want to be than right now, right here with you guys. Because the whole therapy is the emotions don't matter, right? Thoughts don't matter. It's focus and it's behavior. It's what we do with that stuff. So yes, I hurt. Yes, I feel pain and, and, and sadness. But I can bring that with me, right? And I can still do what's important to me, my values, as we hear so many people say. And this is my values. This is my passion. I never thought I'd get well, but I told my mom, I want to help people if I ever can. So there is nowhere else I would rather be than here with you guys. Last two quick things, my parents are not here. This is one of the biggest days. I think this will go with my wedding and kids and maybe Academy Award. <laughs> my third. <laughs> and at first, now they didn't want to come because the pain of this story and the pain of my grandmother, it was too much. And at first I was, I was upset. But yesterday I had this epiphany. I was like, this is exactly what should be happening right now. Because my parents are living their life and doing what's important to them. And I'm living my life and doing what's important to me. And Jason taught me early on the best relationships are the one you're willing to lose. You ever heard that? It, it doesn't mean you don't care about your relationships. Screw you. It means don't be afraid to talk about the hard stuff. Don't be afraid to lose the relationship because you grow 99% of the time. So my parents said to me, we're not coming. We need to do this. In the elevator, I called them yesterday and I said, this is exactly what's supposed to be happening right now. This is perfect. Because I get to talk about, I get to live and experience what I'm talking about. How awesome is that? One more thing. I know I'm jumping around now. I'm just screaming for time. I want to tell you what you do have control over. And what you do have control over is getting sick, relapse. All this talk about don't have control, relinquish control, uncertainty, when I moved out to LA and I started having thoughts again, thoughts that I hadn't had in eight months, I went, oh my God, my OCD's back. And I called Nate at the OCD and I was like, my OCD's back. I, I, I haven't had these thoughts in eight months and I get here and my life is ending. He's like, dude, your thoughts doesn't dictate whether you're sick or not, your actions do. And that moment I went, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're telling me that the thoughts don't matter and, and what matters is whether I compulse or not? He goes, yeah. He's like, you can have thoughts all day long. You know you can't control them. It's what you do in response to the thoughts. And in that moment, I went, awesome. I have to mess up like, for two months to be back to where I was again. I'm not going to do that. And when I learned, we have so few, little control over so many things, but we do have control over focus and behavior. It's the only two things we have control over in this world. And those are the two things that help you get well from OCD and maintain wellness from OCD. Now, I, don't, I, I struggle. My grandma died, I became dysregulated the other day. My parents got on the phone with Katia Moritz. It was like, Ethan's dysregulated, what do we do? And she got on the Skype session and she was yelling at me. And, 
It was my own computer, so I closed it on her. <laughs> Felt so good! So I don't, I'm not up here in like a picture of wellness. I struggle, you guys. It's lifelong, but some days I forget I have it, other days. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Because I identify what's important to me and I go after it. So please know that if you're in maintenance and you're afraid and like, oh my God, what if it comes back? It's in your control. Thoughts don't matter. They're going to be there all day long or not there at all. They're going to spike. They're not going to spike. Good events, bad events, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's, it's what you do with it. Um, so I want to thank you so much for being here. This conference is amazing. This is my fourth conference. Um, I just real quick want to thank my mom and my dad. And I want to dedicate this to my grandma. And I want to thank my family and friends and my therapist, Dr. Moritz and Dr. Spielman and Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Elias and Nate Gruner and Dr. Jenneke, everyone at the OCDI and my current therapist, Michelle Od Odelsberg, and it is in that order. I figured, why not, you know, go in chronological order. I had to, it had to be perfect. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and lastly, I want to thank Jeff and Diane. Is that a song? No, Jack and Diane. <laughs> and the rest of the foundation, because I'd be dead without the foundation. And now I know my mission in life, and it's this. So thank you, Jeff and Diane, for... And thank you.